I, <coughs> you know, I ended up by talking about the future, and the future is, is not what we thought it would be. Um, I want to focus on the current discussion about what the future looks like, uh, which is the discussion that is happening at the level of the UN trying to define development goals for after the MDGs. And particularly, what's the role of ITs, ICTs in that, uh, which is coming in, 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 in a very in very interesting and, and, and highly conflicting ways. Uh, you have probably heard about the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals. It is something that when it first started in around the year 2000, we all laughed at, uh, saying what a ridiculous idea to you know, try to concentrate the, the whole notion of development with all the complexities that we were looking at and so on into an identification of some very uh, low minimum common denominators, easy targets and so on, and how they were uh, defined by a group of uh, technocrats in, in a closed uh, room. Actually, Mark Mellock Brown, then head of the NDP, is actually on the record talking about how when they had finished uh, drawing up the MDGs, they went out of the room and they meet the head of UNEP, the UN Environmental uh, Program, and then they realized, oh my God, we forgot about the environment. So they went back into the room and they came out with goal seven. Okay. But the thing is that that shaped the whole development agenda for the years to come. Uh, or the donor's side of the development agenda, which I think for all practical purposes is the definition of development. Development is what the development corporation ministries do. And since the year 2000, they have been doing is MDGs. And everybody that wanted to do something about development or with development corporation money needed to justify how this issue relates to the MDGs in some way or the other, otherwise you are out of the agenda, you are out of the budget, meaning you don't exist. Uh, and in the research community, that is quite a problem, to be out of the budget. So we have to justify everything in terms of that. And even if for no other reasons, that's why this discussion of what the new development goals are going to be is important, because they will determine the budgets. That's the key um, rationale of the discussion. Now, ICTs were quite absent in the MDGs uh, because you have to understand that the UN is quite slow in reacting to the real world. So, <laughs> you know, there is something about there that, yeah, maybe connectivity <laughs> technologies, uh, connectivity should be enhanced and something like that, but that's, uh, that's all. But, of course, this is not the case now. And, actually, when the uh, whole process was starting and a high-level panel was convened by Ban Ki-moon to provide some initial input into the discussion and it was chaired by uh, David Cameron as UK Prime Minister and the Presidents of Liberia and Indonesia. Uh, David Cameron came out with an um, op-ed piece in the Wall Street Journal envisaging the data revolution as essential in the new development paradigm. And he explains in there how satellite technology will be used to help poor women, poor rural women, access their property right over their land and resources. Uh, cynical, that as I'm a journalist, so that's a professional cynical. Uh, you tend to realize, well, will that not help land grabs more than indigenous women's rural poor women rights and so on. But anyhow, that was data revolution is one of the big concepts that came out of those uh, reports and is uh, floating around in the air. So actually around the notion of data revolution, simultaneously, the, the Ban Ki-moon also created an office which has not been highly publicized, which is called UN Pulse which attempts to uh, harness the potential of big data for development. 
Uh, the paradigm is Google knows when an epidemic is about to start before people know that they're sick. Uh, and they actually made that claim at some moment that if the searches for fever and headache in some area are more than the normal uh, average uh, search, you can detect, you know, and, and even make a diagnosis before people go to the doctor. And, and then you know that the epidemic is starting. The other paradigm is the use of ICTs, satellite technologies, and so on after the Haiti earthquake, which basically helped a lot to do the major feat of Haiti, which was to rescue the white people and the foreigners uh, in a high proportion, uh, much higher than the locals. I am being cynical again. I am exaggerating, but the trend can be can be traced. Of course, those technologies were useful. We wouldn't be here if they weren't. But uh, the notion, the attempt, the new paradigm is there that big data is something that we have to harness and use in favor of development. At the same time, another trend is happening, which is on the governance side of the new development paradigm, the multi-stakeholder partnerships are being promoted as the model. So it's not anymore about state-to-state -state cooperation. It's about multi-stakeholder partnerships. And everything you want to do, you have to frame it in terms of multi-stakeholder partnerships. And that means the internet governance paradigm is being made into the world governance paradigm. And that's how uh, things uh, should be uh, working. And uh, for example, the proposal, in parallel to the discussion of the new development goals, the proposal was put by Ban Ki-moon also in somehow obscure way in the budget that goes to the second committee, to the fifth committee of the General Assembly, there was the proposal to institutionalize the UN partnership facility, which what's going to be the main means of implementation of the new goals that hadn't even started to be officially discussed. So, you know, on, on, on the one hand, you had the institutionalization of a paradigm while the governments were still discussing the goals. Now, things got complicated because uh, many governments started to become suspicious of uh, what was cooking in there in uh, the between some of the key development ministries and the UN in, in this, and a lot of corporations, which uh, uh, appear uh, represented, highly represented, in the high-level panel, in the, the business reports, and in, in the different, uh, in the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is the new name of the Jeffrey Sachs uh, think tank, uh, revitalized into this process as a main academic uh, source of knowledge. Uh, so the, the, the governments, particularly developing country governments, were looking at all these movements and they reminded and remembered the history of the MDGs, which were actually uh, cooked by the OECD much before they were brought into the, um, the UN. And actually in Rio, in the Rio Plus 20 conference, they came out with the idea that they would discuss the development goals and not the UN Secretariat or the technocrats. So they created a parallel process around sustainable development goals, um, which were, were to emerge out of intergovernmental uh, discussions. Uh, now, this is a complicated process. The Open Working Group came out with uh, a list of 17 uh, goals. Uh, many people are saying, or, well, this is the story of a camel designed by a committee. 17 is too much, and so on. But of course, who said? How many? You know, if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which is considered the world's most important document, you know, you have uh, much more than 17 goals embedded in there, and it's still, you know, inspiration and even legal base for the international community. Anyhow, while this process is going on, something or somebody called Snowden comes out, and then people realize, oh, we may have a problem here. 
the reality of power and the use and abuse of power in the world. Uh, and, you know, a guy in the White House spying on the private conversations of two women in Brasilia and Berlin uh, is a problem here. And, 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 and those two women were really very, very mad. I can tell you. And, uh, and they came together and they brought in a resolution about privacy and uh, human rights and so on in the internet. And at the same time, by coincidence, Germany and Brazil blocked the partnership facility in the fifth committee of the UN. And it's, it's basically dead as a, as a proposal by now. Uh, and uh, it, it's not even mentioned. In the meantime, uh, big data uh, is also starting to raise suspicions. And it's basically, hey, all these things that we now know, uh, thanks to Snowden, about how governments use big data, aren't corporations doing the same? No, and, and I think uh, uh, an incredible example is that of the Midwestern farmers in the US. Uh, it came out in the Washington Post. It made a very little noise when a group of farmers started to went to, to Washington to, to ask their congressmen, hey, you know, we realized that in the new harvesting and, and seeding machines and so on that we get, uh, they have embedded communication technology, GPS, and so on that knows exactly the amount of seed, the conditions of the soil, humidity, um, fertilizers being used, and so on. And those data are being transmitted to the uh, owners, uh, you know, the, the producers of these machines, which have been bought by Monsanto and DuPont, which now know they can predict the harvest at least three to four weeks before the U.S. Agriculture Department comes with their official uh, numbers about what the harvest is expected to be. Now, the value of that information in the Chicago commodity market is of billions of dollars. And the farmers that actually unconsciously or consciously provide that information because they get some services and they get seeds tailored to your particular farm if you give information to the seed seller and the company are starting to um, be worried that that will be come over their heads. So we were talking earlier about poor farmers in Kenya and, and so on. Now this is Guys in Iowa, which have Congress people and we have power, it's not small farms really, it's uh, quite uh, an important industry and so on. They were basically told, and that is the record, by their representatives, well, look at the small print in the contracts because this is the future. So all you can do is be careful about the small print. Uh, now, of course, what this is creating in the discussion is um, interesting things. And data revolution is not mentioned. Uh, and a, a kind of the, the, the people that immediately reacted against the data revolution notion as it was being presented, like, okay, the technology, the data, the big amount of information that we gather directly without intermediaries will come and shape the development policies were the intermediaries, meaning the government statistical agencies and the UN statistical department. They said, hey, hey, wait, wait, wait a moment. We, we own those data and we decide what is relevant data, what is a valid indicator and what not. Uh, so the notion of we will strengthen the statistical offices is what is coming out, which is really a very old uh, notion. It's very important, of course. It is a Paris 21 initiative to support that kind of work by the government and so on. But it's not... Uh, 
the ideas associated with the initial notion of the um, data revolution. So that concept has disappeared from the uh, sustainable development goals, but it is coming back in the discussion around uh, the new development agenda, which uh, is still, nobody knows exactly what that means, uh, but people understand, oh, that's the new set of goals that will actually end up uh, prevailing. Whereas multi-stakeholders partnerships has now uh, in the official documents a lower but ambiguous status. The governments are talking in singular about the global partnership for development, which is in a sense a different thing. It's the singular global partnership for development understood as a government to government multilateral system uh, cooperation framework in which if you want NGOs, private sector and so on could uh, participate. NGO community is coming in basically uh, with I would say two approaches. One approach is this is the future, let's jump into it. Uh, and there are many NGOs actively collaborating with the business sector in trying to make the business sector development friendly or the other way around, who is co-opting who we don't know. And some other people that are saying, hey, you know, business should at least be scrutinized in the same way as NGOs are scrutinized. And we should have, you know, criteria uh, of who is a lobbyist as opposed to who is a public interest uh, source of expertise, uh, who is lobbying for their own interest. Conflict of interest should be declared when you make a statement and so on. You know. So who is actually supporting you and, and, and your research and so on. Um, and this is being uh, tabled in, in different uh, fora as um, say a requirement if business is to come in into the discussion it should legitimize itself by um, having uh, been screened and, and vet against uh, certain uh, criteria. Uh, this is a lively discussion. Some documentation is starting to appear around the role of corporations in the shaping of the development agenda. Global Policy Forum published uh, uh, a very interesting paper around that. It's easy to find. Time is short. I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you, you very much.